He was Britain's commander-in-chief on the Western Front for most of the First World War. To some, he was a butcher and a bungler, the man who willingly sent a generation of young men to their deaths. He presided over the bloodiest day in British military history. He is Field Marshal Sir Douglas Hay. I'm Major Gordon Corrigan. I've always been fascinated by military leadership. To me, Haig was a brilliant soldier. He was a master of organization and planning and a visionary champion of new technology. Without him, the history of the 20th century would be very different. And I'm well aware that by adding him to my list of great commanders, I'm being controversial. Douglas Haig was a professional soldier. His whole life was a preparation for the moment when he took command of the King's soldiers here on the Western Front. It was the Western Front that gave him his greatest victory, but it also attracted fierce criticism that lasts to this very day. Born into a family of whiskey distillers, Douglas Haig was a typical reserved lowland Scot. But we can get further insight into his character from the diary he began as a student at Oxford. This, in fact, is his first entry in his first proper diary, Gordon. Um, it's uh, written in February 1883. Having oft times heard of the advantages that derive from keeping a diary, I determined to keep one. <laughs> the difficulty is to have a good day to begin upon. So he's got a sense of humour anyway. Certainly. And, and this goes on throughout his life. Absolutely. And by the time of the First World War, of course, his diary was quite prolific, actually. Right from the beginning of his military career, when he went to Sandhurst, his natural ability shone through. It was clear that he was destined for high command. I mean, there are 35 volumes. He did well at Sandhurst. He was promoted to senior under officer, he came top in the order of merit, and he was commissioned into the line cavalry. It was a good time to be a soldier. The British Empire offered plenty of opportunity for a young officer. And in all his postings, Haig showed one of his great skills, the capacity to observe and learn from others. Back in Europe, Haig was sent off to compare German and French cavalry methods and to update the British Army's manual on cavalry tactics. It all paid off because in 1893, he was selected to attend the Staff College. In Haig's day, the Staff College was here at Camberley. Its aim was to train selected officers for senior command and staff appointments. It was and is the first step to a career to the top. Present Earl Haig is a retired soldier and a keen student of his father's military career, but he also remembers the man. Sir, good morning. Good morning, how are you? He did very well at, at Staff College, didn't he? Yes. Colonel Henderson, who was the chief instructor, uh, prophesied that he would be head of the army. Uh, he was, uh, in his view, a very promising man. And uh, I think it was years later, um, my father in some way was writing about what Henderson had said. He said, well, he, he really must have been talking through his top hat. <laughs> but he wasn't, was No, he, he? wasn't, no. <laughs> After Staff College, Haig was sent to fight in the Sudan, then governed from Egypt where he risked his own life to save an Egyptian soldier, who many of his contemporaries would have left for dead. This engraving Gordon depicts an officer bringing a wounded Egyptian soldier into safety under fire of the enemy at Atbara. The picture was presented to Douglas by his brother officers to commemorate the occasion. According to them, they thought he merited the VC for it. It was an incident that I think reveals what a fine man Haig was. Not only brave and humane, but also modest. 
He didn't even tell his own wife what he'd done. Even she isn't really sure whether it actually happened, whether it's allegorical, whether it's a myth or what. And then everybody really forgets about it. But you've actually discovered a letter that, show, that, that sheds quite a lot of light on it. Well, you? amongst the Hague papers here in the National Library of Scotland, we have a letter from Hague to his sister Henrietta. I was able to pick up a poor dervish of an Egyptian who was wounded in the shoulder and had given himself up for lost. And I put him in front of my saddle and carried him to the guns where we had some spare horses. It's his first action. He must have been shocked himself. The difference between his studies at Camberley mm. and his first act of service must have been immense for him. Yes, because he's come from sort of studying it in, in, in theory and then suddenly he's faced with blood and guts in reality. Absolutely. And, and he does well. He does well. It was a good start, but it was at the War Office from 1905 that Haig really demonstrated what I think was his clearest talent. He was a brilliant and visionary military administrator. Haig transformed the British Army with some of the most far-reaching military reforms ever. One was the setting up of the first real reserve army, the forerunner to today's territorial army. Perhaps Haig's greatest achievement was his part in the creation of the British Expeditionary Force, or the BEF. It was stationed in England, but ready to be deployed to fight a war anywhere in the world. It wasn't very big by European standards, just one cavalry and six infantry divisions, but it was more than we'd ever had before. It was well equipped, it was well trained, it was well led, and it had its own staff. If the First World War had never broken out, Haig would still have got to the top of his profession, but by now the world would probably have forgotten him. But the Kaiser was about to hand him the greatest opportunity and risk of his career. Behind all the smoke and mirrors, the immediate causes of the First World War were really quite simple. A German desire to control Europe and a British realisation that if she did, then the next step would be to take on Britain. The British had to fight alongside the French because if they didn't, they would be the next victim. The conflict broke out in August 1914 when Germany invaded France and Belgium and Britain came in on the side of the French. Within four months, the western front of the war, stretching from the Channel coast to the Swiss border, was bogged down in trench warfare. From December 1915, Haig was commander-in-chief. For the next three years, Douglas Haig was responsible for the British conduct of the war on the Western Front. Much later, critics would label him Butcher Haig because of what happened in 1916, which saw the biggest death toll in a single day in the whole history of the British Army. In 1916, the British attacked the Germans north of the River Somme. The offensive began with a savage seven-day artillery bombardment of the German defences. In the early morning of the 1st of July, 60,000 British soldiers, laden down with their packs and their gas masks, their rifles and their ammunition, and warmed up by a tablespoonful of rum each, climbed out of their trenches and formed up in their lines along a 14-mile front right across this area. Their orders were to advance in line, men five yards apart, at a steady walk over no man's land towards the enemy. To run would exhaust them before they got there. It was hoped that the artillery bombardment before the attack and the artillery barrage during it would destroy most of the opposition. Sadly, it didn't. And there are good reasons for that. This is why Ravine. It's a huge natural feature that the Germans incorporated into their frontline defences. They could shelter way down here, relatively immune to the effects of the British artillery bombardment. But when the artillery stopped, as it had to, it then became a race. 
Could the Germans get their machine guns from out of their dugouts way down here and up to the top of the bank before the British infantry fell on them? What happened next has given some critics the excuse to call Haig incompetent and unfeeling. I couldn't disagree more. All the evidence actually points in quite the opposite direction. The first day of the Battle of the Somme was underway. Douglas Haig, as Commander-in-Chief, would be accused of being the man who presided over the bloodiest day in British military history. This is the Sunken Lane, and in 1916, it ran through no man's land, just over 100 yards from the German front-line position. On that morning, two companies of the 1st Battalion, the Lancashire Fusiliers, were sheltering here, waiting for the order to go over the top. An army cameraman formed them just minutes before the whistles blow. The Lancashire Fusiliers scrambled up the bank. As the Fusiliers emerge from the sunken lane, British artillery is still bringing down covering fire on the German front line, which is just over there in those trees. But as the Fusiliers get to about here, that artillery has to stop, otherwise it's going to kill our own men. And that's the point when the German machine guns start opening fire from their front line. And at that sort of range, it's a turkey shoot. In the extreme south of the British front line, all the objectives were taken, some with the help of the French. But on the northern flank, it was a catastrophe of unprecedented proportions. Another 40,000 men were sent in, only adding more names to the casualty lists. Haig is often accused of not caring about his men, but there's plenty of evidence that proves the opposite. Avril Williams runs this guest house at Ochenville on the former British front line. Twelve years ago, she made a remarkable discovery, and ever since, she's researched what life was actually like for Haig's men. So, Avril, how do you know that this was a stretcher bearer's post? They left graffiti, oh. and uh, we traced the names and found that they were stretcher bearers. Mm -hmm. So this one here, you see, is Jay Lane, second yeah. Royal Fusilier. Mm -hmm. He actually survived the war. Mm -hmm. Then you've got Private H. Weaver. Look, it says stretcher bearer. Oh, yes, yes, And yes. there's his number, yeah. and we traced him, um, and he survived the war as well. We always think Haig was a bit of a butcher, but what he actually did was make sure that the troops were looked after. Avril's discovery underlines a point many forget. Most people believe that Tommy joined the army and then spent four and a quarter years in a frontline trench. That's not actually true, is it? No, not at all. Um, what they'd happened was they spent three months at, at maximum in the front line. This is front line. People forget that front line is just a trench. You can't possibly live three months in a trench. You come back, this is where they feed, this is where they sleep. Um, unfortunately, if you were in a battle, then that's the time when you didn't sleep well, you had funk holes to live in. Here, you had everything. By nightfall on the 1st of July, the British Army had suffered 57,000 casualties over half the number of men that had gone into that first attack, 19,000 of them were dead. So how can I say that Haig was a great commander? After all, he presided over all of this. Well, actually, it wasn't anybody's fault. A tiny pre-war defence industry simply couldn't expand quickly enough to cope with the requirements of modern warfare. They had to take on a lot of untrained labour, and inevitably, a lot of the products, the shells, didn't work. And the army wasn't ready for war either. Despite Haig's army reforms, the British army was tiny. There was no compulsory military service in peacetime, and the battalions were inexperienced and under-trained. That's why the first day of the Somme was a catastrophe. But a great commander cares about the loss of even a single life, and some people think Haig didn't care. At first glance, his diaries might appear to confirm this. This is a secret memorandum from the 1st of August, 1916, the end of the first month of the Battle of the Somme. Um, and he's Haig's giving here the results of the Allied offensive on the west 
which has now lasted just over a month, are as follows. And he says, our losses in this last month's very heavy fighting, totalling to about 120,000 more than they would have been if we had not attacked, cannot be regarded as unduly heavy, nor is sufficient to justify any anxiety as to our ability to continue the offensive. Unthinking, uncaring, unfeeling? Well, in the, in the scale of things, and from, I would say from a layman's point of view, if you actually look cold-bloodedly at, at the amount of dead and wounded, you can't help feel that Haig, for instance, was... You, you've got to call him... Mate, you can call him stoical, but, I mean, you could call him cold, cold-blooded. Yeah, I think that's fair enough. I, I think, actually, any military commander has to be, mm -hmm. because if he wasn't, he'd go bonkers. He couldn't do his yeah, job. Yeah, that's true. He was no butcher. Uh, he was a man who really minded making decisions which would bring death to so many men. But he was a professional man. He had to make decisions uh, which he knew would cost the lives of men, and the men knew they were going to lose their lives. And uh, he himself uh, used to say that I did my best and I think I did a good job for the nation. Haig didn't squander a generation in the First World War. It's a common misconception because of the way the infantry was organised. The soldiers that went into action on the 1st of July 1916 were largely in territorial or PALS battalions, men from the same factories and the same streets who joined up together at the beginning of the war. Now, recruiting infantry battalions in that way was tremendous for team building. But when deaths occurred, they all happened at the same time, and they all affected the same small area. So back home, everybody knew somebody who'd lost a husband or a father or a brother or a son. And that's the reason for the popular misconception that we lost a generation in this war and that Haig was to blame. We didn't, and he wasn't. The same number of deaths spread evenly across the country would have had far less impact. As it was, the French, with a population six million less than ours, had twice as many deaths. Another criticism made of Haig is that he was backward looking. Nothing could be further from the truth. Haig was an innovator. Since 1914, the British had been experimenting with tanks, but it was thanks to Haig that they were used at the Somme in the autumn of 1916. How important were tanks to eventual Allied victory in this war? The tanks probably have changed the, the face of the war and they make the, the war shorter. It was uh, the key of the success because it was the only way to break the barbed wire and to cross the trenches without too much casualties. This British tank was shelled and then abandoned in 1917 and discovered over 80 years later buried in a field. Now, as you uncovered it, what did you feel like? Oh, it was uh, an amazing uh, emotion. Never I was sure to, to be able to find a so complete monument of history. Do we know what happened to the crew? She received five direct hits, which stopped, uh, stopped her and killed four of his crew. Four other survived, including the tank commander. And the tank commander was able to bring back his three men, and for his bravery, he was awarded the military cross. By 1918, just two years after the Somme, the British had become better fighters than the Germans. Haig had learned from his mistakes, and that's the mark of a great commander. He kept his nerve and a belief that we would win the war. It was Haig who spearheaded the introduction of technology to the Western Front. He integrated tanks and aircraft with the troops on the ground to eventually drive through the German defences. By November, the Germans had had enough. Faced with defeat on the battlefield and revolution at home, they pleaded for peace. The guns fell silent at 1100 hours on the 11th of November, 1918. It was Haig's victory. Haig's war didn't end there. What's often forgotten today is how he spent the remaining 10 years of his life. This is the Lady Haig Poppy Factory in Edinburgh, 
set up by the Hague family. At the end of the war, Haig refused to accept a peerage until the government did something for disabled ex-servicemen, which eventually and reluctantly they did. It's not generally known that for the rest of his life, Haig put all his prestige and all his influence towards the welfare of ex-servicemen. After the war, he went on working terribly hard, looking after ex-servicemen, looking after the disabled going around raising money for the Legion. Really a very full program, and it was a tremendous strain, the responsibilities and the decisions that had to be made. For a fairly tired, sick man, I think that was the final straw. Uh, I was just near about to be 10 when he died, but I can only remember him as a terribly wonderful, kind, father and I missed him dreadfully and still miss him. Unlike many politicians, Haig knew from the outset that there was never going to be an easy way to win this war. Douglas Haig did win it. Yes, it was expensive in lives, but if you want to play with the big boys, that's the price you have to pay. Douglas Haig has been grossly misunderstood and misrepresented. He didn't kill all those British soldiers. The German army did. And in a country that maintains a tiny army in peacetime and then has to expand hugely in time of war, heavy casualties are inevitable while that army learns its trade. It was Haig who took a tiny British army and nurtured it until by 1918 it was the only army capable of defeating the Germans on the field of battle. It is that unarguable achievement that makes Douglas Haig a great British commander. <laughs>